Um, welcome everyone. Uh, joyous Feast of the Palms. Uh, we're delighted that uh, you were able to join us today for this online symposium uh, where we're going to be discussing the uh, challenges that the Orthodox Church is facing in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. The wheel is very proud to host this um, August symposium uh, with this wonderful panelists uh, because this subject uh, dovetails into the mission of the wheel incredibly well uh, as we uh, talk about ourselves on our uh, website and our journal uh, the wheel seeks to articulate the gospel intelligently and constructively for the 21st century uh, a pluralistic era that presents Christianity with new and unique challenges, calling for a creative uh, reimagination of the church's social identity and role in public discourse. So uh, now we're all living this uh, crisis, this uh, challenge that uh, is global and uh, unprecedented in definitely in all of our lifetimes. And so uh, we've invited uh, a group of uh, theologians and uh, priests to uh, talk about all these challenges. And uh, thank you very much again for joining us. And the recording of the session will be uh, available on our YouTube channel and on the WHEELS website, uh, www.wheeljournal.com. And with that, I will uh, pass um, the speaker role to uh, our editor, Joseph Clark, who will be moderating this panel. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Inga. Uh, I'm, I'm Joseph Clark, editor at The Wheel and um, an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. The grace of the Holy Spirit today has assembled us. Uh, we sing at the Vespers for Palm Sunday. We're convening this discussion on Palm Sunday in 2020, uh, as Inga said, at a moment when daily life throughout the world has been disrupted by COVID-19, the new coronavirus disease. As of right now, almost 2 million people around the world have confirmed cases of this respiratory virus. It's resulted in about 110,000 deaths so far, and that number is expected to grow substantially. So in many parts of the world, large gatherings, uh, certainly including church services, have been restricted to avoid completely overwhelming hospitals with cases of this disease. And nobody really knows for sure how long these measures will be in place. Many Orthodox church leaders, not all, but many have canceled public services. Um, in churches. And this means that Orthodox Christians are approaching, I think with some uh, trepidation, a Holy Week and Pascha, Easter, that for most of us will be very unusual. Um, having said that, over the past 2,000 years, Christians actually have faced pandemics many times. So this situation is not without precedent in the history of the church, even though it's very unusual for uh, most of us. So in this panel discussion, and this is the first time that The Wheel has hosted an online panel like this, so we're very excited. Um, uh, we're going to explore the consequences of this virus for the church, for Christian life, and think about how the death and resurrection of Christ can shed light on how we understand death, public health, uh, the issues of isolation, community, all of these concepts that have been so much on our minds recently. The situation um, presents us with uh, uh, numerous questions that we are looking forward to exploring with a really distinguished panel of speakers who bring uh, many different uh, highly relevant areas of expertise and points of view. So here's how this is gonna work. I will briefly introduce each of our speakers in turn to offer some reflections on the current situation. After we hear from all of them, we will open things up for discussion among the speakers. Uh, we would like our presenters to engage with one another. And I also have some questions that have been submitted 
online by readers of the wheel that I will uh, introduce into the conversation. So we'll begin with the coronavirus itself and some of the immediate medical implications and issues that it raises. And then from there, we'll move into the implications for the life of the church. So uh, to start us off, I'd like to introduce Gail Wallachak. She is a professor of radiation oncology and cell and molecular biology at Northwestern University and a bioethicist at St. Vladimir's Seminary and the Zygon Center for Religion and Science at Chicago's Lutheran School of Theology. And Dr. Wallachak will speak about some of the uh, life and death decisions that are being made by public officials and by doctors, um, and I suppose to some extent by, by church leaders in deciding uh, when and how to hold services. Gail. Thank you, Joseph. Um, first, I'm gonna just mention a few things about the virus to put it in context. Um, so first of all, this virus is unusual because it's highly infectious. Um, we can catch it even from touching a person that has virus on their hands. And there are examples in Chicago alone where one person has spread the virus to 16 people. So if you think about each person infecting 16 people, then going to church becomes very dangerous. Um, it is a virus that is new and for which there has been no immunity that existed already. So unlike flu, where we've been getting flu for, for hundreds of years in the human population, in, for, for this virus, there's no pre-existing immunity. Um, what else I just want to point out is that the dangers of this virus were actually known, of a possible virus coming into the human population were known for many years. Um, I, I love to read this quote because I think it's perfect. This was written in 2007 from a microbiology group from Hong Kong. And they said, the pr presence of a large reservoir of SARS-CoV-like viruses in, in horseshoe bats, together with the culture of eating exotic animals, mammals in Southern China is a time bomb. So in 2007, they predicted that this might happen. It's an example of where a, a, the world has now become so global that some practice that a very few people do has influenced the entire world. And so we need to realize that there is this huge impact that we wouldn't have predicted. Now, I wanna take it from those sorts of stories with the virus into kind of orthodox thinking about death and dying because that becomes an important issue that we have to consider. Um, in, in, year, for, for in our entire history, there has always been a tension in the Orthodox Church between preserving life and hope for eternal life. And the Church has taken a very strong stand because, by siding with, if there is something we can do, we do it. And when it reaches a point where we can no longer do anything, then it's time to let go. Um, I, I love to quote this uh, quote from St. Basil. Um, St. Basil, as, as everybody knows, formed the first hospitals. So the first hospitals were done by St. Basil. And he said, medicine is a gift from God, even if some people do not make the right use of it. Granted, it would be stupid to put all hope of a cure in the hands of doctors. Yet there are people who stubbornly refuse their help altogether. All the different sciences and techniques have been given to us by God to make up for the deficiencies of nature. Not by chance does the earth produce plants that have healing properties. It is clearly evident that the creator wants to give them to us to use. That sort of thinking has been a very big part of how our church has thought about things. Now, in modern life, the ventilator has become a tool that physicians don't mean to use, but is often a decider. A family decides to put somebody on a ventilator because um, there is hope for life and they want to continue to try. The family might decide to take the person off the ventilator because there is now no longer any hope. That ventilator has been a physician's tool. It's usually a discussion that's based with the spiritual father for an Orthodox family, and they're very hard decisions. But what's happened today is that 
because ventilators are limited, we are now no longer able to use them as this sort of a tool. Now what happens is physicians are put in the very, very bad position of having to decide who will get the ventilator and who will not. So it's no longer, we have all these ventilators, we have a person that needs it, what will we do? It's now, we don't have enough ventilators, what will we do? Um, there are a lot of false ideas out there about what people are claiming uh, can happen. For instance, I've heard stories like, well, they're just gonna give them to only young people because this disease is worse for elderly and so therefore we won't, we won't do that. Um, one of the reasons why we've been asked to shelter in place is to keep the numbers low so that ventilators are not the limiting feature. We know in some cities they are, in some countries they are, but we're trying to keep it so that people don't die that wouldn't have had to die otherwise because we are out of ventilators. But what the criteria are that are currently being used if there is a ventilator shortage, and there are a few places where there is, where there's a ventilator shortage, is they're doing three steps. They're saying, number one, if the person has irreversible shock, then they won't respond well to a ventilator. Number two, if they've had organs that have failed already, then try to get them to be able to breathe might not be so useful. And then the third idea is you see how the person is responding to the ventilator, and if they are not responding well, then you give up. That's not how we would normally do it in normal practice. That's what happens only if ventilators are present in short supply. But you can imagine that as the disease progresses, as it invades more and more of our population, that ventilators become a very, very critical issue. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to say. I've, to try to put it in some context. Happy to step in later. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wallace-Jack. Um, I would like to turn now to um, Father Andre Kordochkin. So Father uh, Andre is an author and a priest at St. Mary Magdalene Russian Orthodox Church in Madrid in Spain. So he's really been right at the center of one of the hotspots of this virus and has been seeing the implications of what Dr. Wallacecheck just described, um, the implications for church life uh, up close for weeks now. Father Andre. Yes, well, for me, the uh, last few weeks of ministering in a city which has been one of the centers of the infection made me uh, revise many things that we otherwise take for granted. And when I say ministering, I also say ministering in a very physical and material sense because until today we have been celebrating the Eucharist and we try to celebrate it in a form uh, which is maybe in a limited way but uh, accessible uh, to the public. Uh, you may want to ask if this is legal. Well, if you've read St. Augustine or if you've read Martin Luther King, you know that um, legal is not always synonym of good and illegal is not always a synonym for bad but uh we tried to use uh, a certain uh gap in the present legislation which actually allows religious ceremonies under certain uh limits although it uh doesn't allow for a person to uh to well to travel or to come to the church so uh, it's a very strange legislation which permits you to be in the church but it doesn't allow you to come to the church it's a kind of one of the jokes of this uh, new communist government that we have. And um, if you look at the reactions in the Russian church that we've seen recently, I think that uh, there, has been, there have been two. Some people would say that basically uh, the church should be celebrating in the same way as it always did, uh, without accepting any limits. And some people would say that we should absolutely withdraw from the public sphere for the uh, safety and for the well-being of all. Now, to me, none of these answers is satisfactory because it is, none of them uh, is uh, faithful to the nature of the church. Of course, the church cannot be uh, reduced to a ceremony. And Christianity is not about ceremonies, but uh, also uh, Christianity is not just an intellectual doctrine. Now, uh, what would be the correct way? And what would be the solution? I would, uh, I don't know, many, may, maybe some of you know, Maybe some of you have seen there is an uh, open letter published uh, on a website which is called We Are an Easter People Com, which is uh, prepared by two uh, Catholic 
lay women in the United States, which is directed to the bishops. And uh, they ask the bishops in the present situation to make the sacraments, well, celebrating, of course, in a safe way, but to make them more available. Well, you may find that this letter is not, theolog is not a theological diamond, but I think that it has two interesting uh, points. The first is that it is a voice of the church that speaks not from above, not by encyclical letters, but which speaks from below. And the other important thing is that uh, it defines the well-being of the uh, of of man, not only in terms of his uh, uh, of his physical health. Because if you open any newspaper, if you uh, read any news on the virus, what is really neglected is the emotional impact that it produces on the people. And I would say that this emotional impact is in a way direct because people suffer from anxiety, people suffer from depression, but it will also be indirect because uh, the virus will have its economical consequences, which will impact people very severely. Now, uh, I think that the church and the sacraments are important uh, in a way to help uh, our members um, to, um, well, to preserve their uh, emotional and their uh, spiritual integrity. And in the end, I think that the, the real question which we're facing now in a situation like Spain or any other countries which has limits on what, 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 should, what, what can, one can do or what, what one cannot do is, um, is really a question, what is a man? And what are his basic necessities? So are we ready to say that uh, our basic necessities are food and toilet paper, which is what we're allowed to, well, to, to buy or to uh, come out of our house to, uh, uh, to bring it in? Or is there something else that we can call basic necessities? So for example, this was the position of the Catholic bishop in the city of uh, Cordoba in Spain, because the uh, present legislation on the state of alarm says that someone comes for his basic necessities. Well, he said that you know, coming out and walking um, a few hundred meters to uh, participate in a mass, which has five, ten participants, is, is a basic necessity. And this is something that he defends. So um, although uh, I think that for many people, the times that we're living through can be a very available experience. And this loneliness which they're coming through may also be a way of participating in the in the loneliness of Christ himself. But if you ask me how can a church live without the Eucharist, I would say that the church should look for a way, uh, or the churches or whatever you call it, would, should look for a way to keep celebrating it. A way which would be safe, a way where people uh, would feel safe uh, participating in it. And in the cases where it is impossible, I think that the Christian communities and the leaders of the Christian communities should look for a uh, a legal uh, way to look for it because there, there is a certain number of people who feel that they're abandoned and uh, that they're betrayed by uh, those who uh, are the spiritual leaders of their spiritual community of their communities. Um, well, these are just few observations that I wanted to, to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Andre, um, and thank you for bringing up. Um, the uh, several important questions of um, the relationship between church and state and government restrictions on church activities, which I'm sure we'll re return to in this discussion, and, um, and also the question of when it is appropriate to, um, to not have church services or when, in fact, it's, it's the right decision to, to go ahead with um, the life of the church. I'd like to, um, to now uh, turn to uh, Father Peter Scorer, um, he is the rector of the Holy Prophet Elias Parish in Devon, England, um, a parish of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. Uh, Father Peter is a graduate of Oxford University and St. Vladimir's Seminary. Father, following his ordination of a deacon, he served for many years with the late Metropolitan Anthony of Soroj, um, and he's written a number of essays on 20th century Orthodox Christianity. So, uh, so Father Peter, would you like to talk about your um, experience of uh, this um, this time of the virus um, in uh, in England? Thank you. 
Uh, I find myself in a strange situation where we have a parish which, as many of our parishes in Western Europe and the Western world generally, it consists of about uh, 75 people uh, from various nationalities. English converts form the sort of the, the root, the base of it, but otherwise we have Russians, Greeks, Serbs, uh, Bulgarians and so on who come, all bearing with them different traditions. And when it came to our understanding that it would no longer be possible to have any services. We first liturgy we did about a, more than a month ago, we used all the possible sort of um, precautions and we had wooden spoons and disposable cups, but that worked for one week. Then the next week we said, no, nobody can come, but some, we left the church open on a Sunday so that two or three people at a time could just come in and say a prayer. And then after that, the church was locked and only I can go with, uh, with my wife, Irina, we can go together. And I go there every day and say some prayers. And it led me to think this extraordinary phenomenon that our, our faith is so totally liturgically based. I'm sure that for the number of people that I've spoken to in our parish, they are desolate because the only expression of the faith that they have is a Sunday attendance at a church, not even necessarily partaking of the sacraments, but just coming to church with their children, lighting candles, being there, being part of a very close-knit community because we all meet up after the liturgy, we all share a cup of coffee and conversation and talks and so on. And I'm thinking in particular of not so much, I'm, I like those of my uh, clergy brethren on the whole, we are, we are privileged. I can celebrate a liturgy at home, I can go to the church and pray. But those who, for whom the center of worship, the center of their faith, the center of their identity as religious persons is liturgical, this makes it extremely difficult. And this is something which we have to address. We have to understand what it is uh, to be a Christian without an assembly, without the coming together, without the ecclesia, without the prichot, the coming together, the gathering together of all the people of God that may all may be one. And this poses a number of very, very difficult and very interesting questions in the age in which we live, because this is. I would say, although possibly there have been times of war, there have been times of other epidemics, but this is a time which is in some ways in our modern age, totally unprecedented. And my question really would be to all the participants of how we answer this particular question. We can talk and we have heard, and I have listened to a number of you here present and been very grateful for a number of the things that you've said. And it is particularly hard at this time of the year, as we enter into Holy Week, as I mentioned before, Christ is probably the loneliest person in the history of mankind, the man God, who is lonely and isolated and forsaken at, in, in Golgotha and on the cross. And we have to take up our cross and we have to enter into Holy Week and follow our Lord. I won't go on rambling now, but I'd love to hear other people's views and thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father Peter. Um, on this uh, point about um, uh, following uh, uh, Christ and his, his journey as we, um, as we travel through Holy Week, um, I'd like to turn to somebody who I, I think can uh, perhaps shed light on, on some of these other questions that have come up. Uh, Sister Dr. Vasa Laren, uh, a Rasafor nun, a scholar of Orthodox liturgy, and also one of the church's best known digital pioneers as the producer of the popular online series, 
coffee with Sister Vasa. Uh, oh. At a moment oh. when so many Christians are um, not able to participate in church services in the usual way, uh, Sister Vasa is going to speak to what it means to experience Holy Week liturgically during this time. Thanks, Joseph. It's Dr. Sister, not Sister Doctor. Ah, forgive me. That, that was a joke. All right. So um, uh, thanks um, for, you know, that question and for the previous speakers. Um, when I, you know, I'll, I've also had a tough time with this. Uh, it's already been, I think, five weeks at this point in Vienna. Um, and people are starting to just go a little bit, I don't know, get a little bit strange. Like this very old lady uh, came out. I was sitting on a bench, it's allowed now, uh, in front of my building today. And it is Easter, Easter Sunday for most of Christianity. Uh, and, you know, people want to do something. And she was wearing a mask and she looked very disoriented. Uh, and there were actually not many people out and, and where I was. So I was sitting on a bench uh, and... She didn't sit on any of the benches, even though everyone's very good at social distancing. And she comes and she sits right next to me. <laughs> and I was, I was startled because, you know, I, I sprang up and, you know, moved away. And then I felt really bad because she just looked very lost, you know. And so I said, happy Easter to her um, in German. And then she didn't really understand what I'm saying. Um, in any event, uh, you know, um, experiencing some that's not a big deal but it was a little bit traumatic you know like i felt bad for her and she's i don't know have, having a hard time with the social distancing um on the other hand despite the fact that it is really hard um i'm finding church wise that our fear or the fear i hear from some priests like are we still church are we able to maintain church you know we've had in the 20th century a lot of very fashionable sort of, you know, Eucharistic theology that's, I think, you know, let certain aspects uh, of liturgy also fall through the cracks. And I think the silver lining here uh, is to rediscover um, those aspects of our church life that are not, uh, you know, the divine liturgy. I mean, I... I hope and believe that this shall pass, that we're not gonna live this way all the time, but the extraordinary situation uh, helps us to rediscover, I think, those things that are accentuating, uh, accentuated during Lent. Um, Lent that is really an invention, I would say, in the form that we have it today of, I would say a lay movement known as monasticism. Monasticism is initially a lay movement. It's not a movement initiated by bishops. It's lay people going out from the established and cathedral services, right, to uh, deny themselves. Uh, you know, you know, it was very contested in monasticism, uh, even still in the fifth century, as to whether singing should be allowed you know, in services, that that's a distraction, that it's, uh, it brings one out sort of of one's, uh, you know, focus. Um, so the, the lay movement that is monasticism that really invents the form of the liturgy of the hours or the daily office um, is something, you know, and also the rediscovery of the weekday. In Lent, really Lent happens mostly in the weekdays. All the Old Testament readings are done in the weekdays. The actual services of the hours are completely different. They're very solemn. There's the singing of the central troparion of the hour. Um, and um, the fact that we seem very reluctant to get out of our totally only Eucharist focused, just, I mean, the Catholics have the same problem. After the council, they really only have Eucharist. Everything's disappeared, like Vespers, Matins. There's basically, not that it was uh, in a good state before Vatican II, but with us, um, you know, it's no secret that our, uh, our people, by and large, uh, really only come to divine liturgy, right? And so it's a Sunday kind of, a Sunday only 
church existence. So to, I'll get to my main point. There is a call, I think, through this to responsibility, increased responsibility of the laity, which I think is a very good thing. We, just as our liturgy has, you know, largely also because of a systemic problem with the way liturgy is done, it's sort of a spectator sport, you know, where you do watch the show that's put on for you. Sometimes, uh, you know, the choir has really prepared for it a lot. There's lots of choir rehearsals, but those people not involved, like for women, the opportunity to be involved is limited perhaps to the choir. If you don't have a musical ear, that wouldn't be open to you. Um, these are all huge topics, but to be able to uh, pick up those, you know, tools of some kind of doing of the hours, I've I found my own way to suggest it to my little, you know, following that I have on my like weekday podcast, which I feel like people are hungry for now of just reviewing, like, let's review who are, you know, at this point during great week, we're not doing the Meneon, so the saints aren't really an issue, but we do, you know, a brief overview of what are the saints of the day, both calendars and what is happening in the Triodion. And somehow, you know, to be nurtured in the way that we can now because this kind of panic of with you know because the only thing we we've had this focus whereas it's rather new it's rather new for uh, for the church uh to actually be teaching that without the eucharist you're dead as church i mean in monastics, you know that originally in organized monasticism, the monastics, monastics were very reluctant to agree to be ordained to anything. So they were, uh, you know, there was that danger of them, I'm um, oversimplifying, but being a church out within the church uh, with their own rules. But, and then to oversimplify it, Florovsky thinks that the, the church does a clever thing when it makes monastics bishops eventually, so that uh, we cover both bases, you know, like, and thus smother the independence of monastics in our embrace. <laughs> Give them some, a nice hat and that'll take care of them, you know. Um, but I think that a, a spirit of responsibility, uh, in other words, an ability to respond to the uncommon call now to the laity, look, just as in liturgy, okay, I know that not every parish is like this, but we've become spectators, but we also be have become spectators in these, you know, the, the bishops issues that have become like pan-Orthodox issues, but they're really limited to the hierarchs, that they don't really have a lot to do with the interests or needs of people, uh, very far removed issues to, by and large. Um, maybe it's good for people to take uh, responsibility, also the kind of responsibility that when you're working from home, you have to organize, um, you know, your prayer and, you know, worship sort of schedule, but organizing your work schedule for those of us who always work at home, no, is just, there's all these demons that you discover, <laughs> you know, that keep you from being like a useful uh, human being, but for people to be called to just that daily discipline, which is what liturgy is about, you know, even uh, for whomever, not just monastics, um, might be, you know, um, bringing us out of that consumerist uh, approach to church life, uh, into which I think uh, in most of our churches we have slipped. I'm a consumer, I sit back uh, and see how Father does today, how the choir does, but on a larger scale in our whole church life, you know. All right, I think my time is up. That's terrific. Thank you very much, Dr. Sister. Uh, and you, you raised um, some really interesting points about um, the, the nature of the church and the relationship of the church to, uh, to the Eucharist. Um, to, um, to maybe... Um, shed some more light on that, I, I'd like to turn to um, Archimandrite Cyril Hoveroon. He's an associate professor of theological studies at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles and acting director of the Huffington Ecumenical Institute. And he's also the author of several major books on ecclesiology, 
including the 2017 book, Scaffolds of the Church Towards Post-Structural Ecclesiology. It seems to me, Father Cyril, that um, as uh, Sister Vasa was uh, alluding to, um, this is, among other things, an opportunity for us to contemplate the nature of the church in maybe a different light. Thank you, thank you, Joseph, and uh, thank you for mentioning uh, mentioning the book. Actually, you're probably one of of a few who read it completely because you edit, copy edited, and I really appreciate your work <laughs> for the for the book. Uh, but this is just a side note. I just uh, want uh, to say that I completely concur with uh, Sister Vassa, <clears throat> and I all of a sudden found myself to discover the you know the meaning of monasticism uh, for the first time maybe in many years being landed now for you know several weeks uh, not being in air it's uh, a fascinating feeling you know uh, and in a sense we all uh, are somehow monastics in these days at least we are recluses even us i mean the, the former monastics <laughs> so it's a great experience for uh, for all of us um, um, actually i don't know what exactly to uh, ca i can add uh, and the, what i can tell uh, to this group of people i think it's a great time for liturgical scholars and they should uh, speak more than us uh, and also it's a great time for people like gail i would really love to to to, to hear more from gail uh, from the from the point of view of science um uh, and um, what i wanted nevertheless to say maybe to add is the following I think, uh, and you, you, Joseph mentioned in the beginning that uh, the church faced this kind of uh, um, epidemics or even uh, pandemics uh, many times in the past. Um, and the humanity faced it many times. Uh, and uh, it is for the first time that this kind of, that we see this kind of reaction from both the church and the, and the humanity, from the humankind, that the entire planet is shut down essentially. And I believe uh, the only reason, uh, the only difference why, unlike in the, in the past, the, the entire planet, the entire world is shut down, is because we learned to value minorities. The, the whole thing that we are facing now, it's about minority, a minority. It's about a minority of people who may die. And it's, really, it's a really tiny uh, minority, a very small number of people who are exposed to, to this danger. And for the sake of those people, those Know, even factions, fractions of, of 1% who may die from the humankind, we do all things that we do. They, we sacrifice, we are ready to sacrifice even our you know, Easter liturgy and so forth. And this is a very interesting situation. This is a very interesting result of the lessons that we've learned uh, during the last decades, I believe. This is also an interesting, interesting situation because all of a sudden, all of us discovered that we may belong to this minority. Even those people who proudly uh, belong or used to feel that they belong to majorities, they all of a sudden uh, found themselves vulnerable. Even people like, you know, I don't know, Boris Johnson, who has been affected, people like Putin or Trump can suddenly, you know, find, find themselves in, in that very small minority and they are really afraid, they are scared, <laughs> uh, as all of us. And uh, I think this is uh, an interesting point, an interesting situation that we may uh, deliberate upon, probably, uh, uh, this value of minority rethinking of, of, of belonging to a minority of being a minority. It's a great lesson. Um, another, another point which is different that I'd like to raise, uh, very briefly is that, um, uh, it's also a great time for us. Well, it's a great time to, to rethink, reconsider many things like monasticism, like minority, uh, many other things. I'd like to, uh, stress one more thing. The last one is uh, the idea of the sacred, uh, sacred place, sacred space. I, I explore this idea in my book, The Scaffolds of the Church, and I believe it's a great uh, time now for us to rethink what is what sacred space means it means for us. Um, in my book, I um, uh, made uh, made the reference to Dura Evropos, uh, a city, well, a settlement in in Syria. Uh, uh, Half of it has preserved in Yale. You, Joseph, know it well. We visited together with you and Inga uh, the gal Yale Gallery and explored him, had many chances to explore uh, Dura Europos. And I think it's, it's, well, it's a great artifact. I mean, the, the entire place and what they brought to Yale and you know, what you can still uh, explore in Syria. Uh, but what has happened nowadays, I think just as every, every one of us feels like a bit of recluse or a bit of mon monastics, in the same sense, every community in the world uh, uh, found itself in a situation of being 
Dura Europas. All of us are Dura Europas now. All of us are um, uh, household churches, household communities. We come, we gather together in our homes, we celebrate whatever we can celebrate, uh, and uh, we do exactly what the early Christians did in Dura Europas. They came, uh, they stayed, or they came to a home, and uh, they did whatever they could in, in their homes. Um, so it's, uh, it's, I think it's a great experience for the church to, re to rediscover all of a sudden that uh, it's not only sacred and designed, especially it's a consecrated sacred place that we, uh, which is a sacred place. It can be any place, it can be our home. Uh, and uh, that's, that's what I wanted to say. And the last, the very last thing that we just connected with this, it's a very practical suggestion. I just made it today in the morning on, on the Facebook. Uh, that in the, way, uh, in the wake of, of this rediscovery of the meaning of the sacred space, I think we need certainly, and we must, it's, in, it's, it's, it's urgent, it's imminent because of the Easter uh, services. We need to, this, to re, well, readjust the practices of, of uh, partaking communion. And my practical suggestion probably could, also emphasize this was to th that we have to allow people to get uh, holy communion in, the, in their homes, uh, so they should be uh, distributed uh, their holy gifts. Uh, they should be given to the hands of of the lay people, brought to their homes, and they, then they could consume, uh, participate in the Eucharist during the night or morning of the Easter. So those are my my points that I would like to bring. They are not systematic, just you know. Uh, something I wanted to share. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Father. And um, we appreciate your um, Palm Sunday palm tree in your backdrop. Um, you, you, you bring up a number of points that I'm sure we'll come back to in the discussion. Um, but I'd like to turn now to um, somebody who actually has, has written a book on sacred space, among, among other things. Um, the um, uh, uh, Father Deacon Nicholas Denisenko uh, who is a scholar of sacramental theology um, and the Emil and Elfrida Joachim professor at Valparaiso University in Indiana. And he's written actually many books and articles on Orthodox liturgical life. So Father uh, Nicholas. Thank you very much. Um, and I um, appreciate this opportunity very much and I've already learned a great deal from uh, what everyone else has said. So I, I wanna talk a little bit about um, what liturgical reform looks like. Uh, just a, a brief summary. Um, we've already discussed the desire to maintain some continuity in Eucharistic celebration. Um, and in the discussion within the church on uh, what, how we should respond to the COVID-19 crisis, um, I've observed that there has been a, a defensive posture to try to sustain as much as possible some sense of the ordinary rhythm of church life. Now, certainly this is understandable. Um, we really don't like change very much, and some might say that Orthodox are, are much more averse to change than others. I'm, I'm not sure how true that is. Uh, but uh, some change has already happened. So for example, we saw that instead of uh, kissing the priest's hand or kissing icons, we've learned that uh, some synods of bishops have uh, said that a, a reverent bow is uh, an acceptable gesture. And in some places there have been slight modifications made to the way that people can receive communion. Uh, now, whether or not these will stick is an open question. It's, it's very difficult to say. We don't know the future, um, but I think it's, it's safe to say uh, that it opens the door to imagining whether and what kinds of changes might happen. Those are the kinds of things that I might think of as fine-tuning as opposed to liturgical reform. Um, we've also seen the expansion of the use of technology to uh, try to promote the people's participation. And I appreciate um, what Sister Vasa said about a spectator show about watching liturgy because uh, the church has seemed to very quickly embrace the idea of live streaming or translating liturgy online, which many churches had already been doing as a ministry to shut-ins and invalids and people who perhaps were traveling and couldn't attend divine liturgy. And now uh, here we are participating in this symposium, seeing one another's faces and talking to one another via Zoom. 
And there are communities that are having liturgies of the word of God, and I haven't heard of this yet. Uh, I know in the Protestant world, there have been uh, Eucharistic liturgies that have occurred over Zoom. And so perhaps this will uh, open the doors to uh, another kind of liturgical reform. Now, um, I, I want to talk for just a couple of minutes about a, a debate that um, I've heard about in the context of Holy Week and Pascha. And this is the deep disappointment that many of us feel about not being able to uh, observe our usual very beloved customs of being able to go to the church. And this is the question of, well, how, with a skeleton crew liturgy and doors locked, do we continue to maintain Holy Week and Pascha? And it's interesting to see that the, the church's playbook has been to say, well, there are readers' versions of the offices that would be said in the church that people can do at home. And I opened one of those, um, an example of those up, I think it was the Matins of Holy and Great Saturday, and, and the the version that they were calling for people to do at home was 60 pages. And uh, I asked myself, well, is this how people pray? And we have information on this. We know that the prayer life that people maintain at home certainly draws upon the liturgy. And we all know that there is a desire to participate in the official liturgy of the church. But liturgy is just one source of the way that people pray at home. There are a number of different ways that people pray at home. And um, so there's a symbiosis between home prayer and the public and official liturgy, but it's not necessarily the same thing. I don't know if you can take the official liturgy and simply say, here, do this at home, have a procession around your house at the epitaphios or the plashtanitsa, and go to your door and knock on it and start to sing the troparian. Maybe some people will, will do this. What I think, um, one of the things that's emerged in terms of uh, a sort of like a, a, a new kind of a clericalism, or perhaps a clericalism that's been there all along, is this notion that somehow um, a priest has to be present in every uh, aspect of the way that we pray. Uh, for example, would it not be appropriate for people for these offices of Holy Week where really as a church we read uh, more of the Bible perhaps in one week than we do for the rest of the year, to simply say to the people, uh, be at ease in your homes and just, uh, and to the best of your ability, read the word of God, hear it, maybe sing a hymn or two, and to understand that our liturgical life, our whole prayer life, doesn't depend only upon the Eucharist that's being celebrated at church, but that there is a descent of the Holy Spirit, that there is a real vibrancy and assurance of the presence of Christ with us when we hear the word of God and we talk about it and we go about our usual business without necessarily having to be experts and constantly turning each page one after another and trying to squeeze the public liturgy into the domiciles of our homes. So I think that one of the ways to go about this is to reestablish trust between the laity and the clergy. Um, you know, there's been an a impulse to assure the laity that everything's going to be okay, right? Um, and perhaps to reassure the laity that everything is going to be okay with the church, when perhaps what we should all be doing is paying attention to what's going on in the world while we pause some of the things that we normally focus on. And here, perhaps, the, the roles need to be reversed a little bit to, to ask the clergy to trust the laity that the risen Christ will be in our midst, that when we gather in our homes, that, that we will pray, we will come together, we will do good things. And even if it's not as long or it doesn't follow the rhythm or the content or the fullness of the liturgies that we love in church, that it is still a holy gathering of a royal priesthood, a holy nation, the, the people of God. And um, in a certain sense, you know, without a doubt, we should all be focused on what's happening in the world and, and allow um, the presence of Christ among us at this time to embolden us, to fill us, so that we can together really focus our intention, not so much on saying, did we defend the practices that we hold so dear, um, 
but did we do everything that we could in the moment to, uh, with Christ, contribute to the healing of the world? And uh, so thank you for the opportunity to, to say a few words. Thank you very much. To expand uh, uh, finally on this um, issue of communion and the Eucharist, um, I'd like to turn to our, our final speaker, uh, Archpriest Alexis Vinogradov, who is a writer and architect and the retired rector of St. Gregory the Theologian Church in Wappingers Falls, New York. Uh, Father Alexis is also well known as the translator of important works by Fathers Alexander Schmemann and Alexander Men. Um, so Father Alexis, at, the, at this moment when so many Christians are unable to participate in uh, church services in the usual way, is going to um, pick up on this question of what we might be able to learn from this crisis about the nature and the meaning of communion. Thank you, uh, Joseph. It's a real thrill and, and a delight to be with all of you right now. And um, I treat this very experience right now, a little gathering here, as a vital opportunity for true communion. Uh, that's not defined, perhaps, by the liturgical ordo. And if I can try to pick up a little bit of what I've uh, been hearing through through Nick, through our Holy Fathers, through through Sister Vasa, uh, for me, um, it strikes me now, uh, well, they say retired. You know, it's been five years. Don't believe them. You never retire. <laughs> you get busier, really. Uh, but it's it's wonderful not to have the burden, I suppose, of uh, of. Wor of kind of structuring and ordering the liturgical life for the community. So we have the, the luxury of sitting back and making commentaries on it, uh, as, as we're doing now, perhaps. But for me, there, uh, it see, strikes me as a, as a vital pastoral opportunity, a great pastoral opportunity to, to actualize what we often teach and speak about, which is making that link between the liturgical life and the daily life of our of our communicants and so um uh, so i'll just kind of uh take some cues from some of the notes that i've made about this this theme this idea as broad as it is but uh for one thing the um the whole eschatological nature of of our of our liturgical life uh, that is given to us just in this feast itself for example as a, a pastoral reminder for people that this is an ongoing reality. You know, we have, we were posting today uh, our Easter greetings to people in the West and Palm Sunday greetings to people in the East and forgetting that every Sunday is, is Pascha, right? Uh, and uh, Seraphim of Sarov greeting everybody 365 days a year. Christos was crazy, my radest. You know, Christ is risen, my joy. This, this understanding that the risen Christ is present among us. So that eschatological fact of our life, uh, in this feast, today Christ rides on a foal into Jerusalem. Today the children uh, shout with branches and lay out their clothing as carpeting for the Savior. Uh, it's a similar prayer for the blessing of water and epiphany that today, today keeps ringing out all the time. Um, and how does we transition, therefore, from this understanding of, of communion as being filled with this eternal life and ourselves becoming uh, communion. And I think of a few examples, um, an event in my own uh, life many years back with, uh, we were much younger, with uh, Father um, Michael Aksonov and his wife uh, Olga, who teaches now uh, in, in uh, D.C. And we were at New Skeet and we were talking about what do we do uh, it's a kind of like a liturgical technical question. So if you can't get to an Orthodox church, for example, uh, can, is, it, is, it, is it valid, quote unquote, we like these terms, to go to a, a Catholic church? How do we look at it? How do the Orthodox look at it? And, um, and uh, Father uh, Michael asked the question, so what did people do uh, in a time of St. Herman? I mean, he wasn't an ordained priest. So how could they receive communion? And without... Blinking an eye, Olga, Matushka Olga, answers him back, well, of course, what are you talking about, Mishra? She says, uh, Herman, Herman himself was their communion. And it's this, it's this sudden awareness that here we are sent out ourselves to be uh, communion for, for, for the whole uh, uh, population around us, wherever 
uh, we may be, that we can become communion. We're called to depart in peace. I want to uh, uh, just read a short email that was sent to me by one of our parishioners and contemplating this issue of becoming ourselves, the living communion for people. Um, she says, I was talking about this question via email with X, and he was talking about seeing Christ being manifest in the kind and caring acts of so many during this time. When I thought more about it, I realized that I had received more quote-unquote communion this week outside, blowing kisses back and forth with the children across the street, talking across the width of a friend's car, people leaving me groceries and surprises on my doorstep, phone calls, etc., than I ever did in any Holy Week past. On one level, it feels like all hell has broken loose, but it appears as all heaven has too. Um, and, of course, that <laughs> reminds, and I'm sure Sister Vasa would know, the, the story of the, of the monastery where one monk has a vision that the end is coming. They all rush for the chapel to do an all-night vigil. They pass by the kitchen, and they alert the cook, and they alert him twice and three times, and he's not moving. And finally, they come back, and they say, come on, brother, the, the, uh, the world is ending. I'm staying put, he says because in the morning when the world has not ended and you're all hungry, I'll have food for you. <laughs> so that this, this life of communion must, uh, must continue and, and, and be actualized uh, for us in, in our life. And it seems to me that it is here that there's a pastoral uh, uh, responsibility to remind people of the rituals of life, of, of uh, listening to poetry, playing music and cooking, and not necessarily uh, establishing quasi uh, liturgical forms of uh, of being together of uh, I, I think of uh, Mother Maria Skopcova and perhaps I'll I'll end on that just to say how how she urged us to to uh, to extend our life outside of the liturgy into the service of of our of our brothers and perhaps she may have said something to this effect of moving finding ourselves transitioning from the service of liturgy to the liturgy of service, you know, uh, no, making that seamless movement. Um, while our hierarchs and our teachers were certainly providing us materials that we could use at home, I think pastorally it would have been also nice and it would be nice to hear how those who are trying to, let's say, observe the fasting rules, how at this time, you know, we are fasting from from this physical companionship already is that not in itself a heavy a heavy fast and so for those who are infirm for those who are tending to our needs who are who are really stressed out maybe to offer a blessing to them to just sit down and have a good piece of red meat <laughs> you know just to be fortified uh, during this time uh, it might be a kindly kindly gesture that moves us outside of the the the, the rigid framework uh, that, of course, is also necessary for the orderliness, orderliness of our life, but uh, at the same time to recognize and celebrate those ways in which we become, as I say, for one another, the living communion, the liturgy after the liturgy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father Alexis. Um, so we've... Um, we, we've heard so many perspectives and we've placed so many issues on the table. This is a really, uh, the situation has so many facets um, that we are happy we have such a large group to, um, to try to unpack some of them. Um, I'd like to invite our um, participants now to um, uh, respond to anything that you've heard. And I just um, wanted to throw in one, um, one question that was sent in by uh, one of the readers of The Wheel who notes that various Orthodox clergy and hierarchs have approached this crisis in quite different ways, including disparate opinions on services and practices of communion that have sometimes been in tension with what senior church leaders have directed. This reader uh, sees a similar disconnect between the expectations and the actions in some cases of the faithful and some of the uh, directions that they have received from church leadership. Um, so what, what are we to make of this? And I think we've, we've just already heard in the past few minutes 
um, different, uh, different uh, views and different uh, ideas for what it means to and how we can have a, a worship life uh, during this um, situation. So, so what are we to make of this very diversity in practices and sometimes the disconnect between what, what people are doing and, and some of what we hear? Would anyone like to uh, take that on? Um, I should say we, we can actually um, unmute uh, the participants' uh, uh, microphones, or you can unmute if, you, if you'd like to speak. Um, you can unmute yourself. Um, yeah, this is Gail. I'll, I, I don't have a lot to say on this, but one, one thing I'll comment on is that there has been a great deal of criticism of hierarchs for closing churches or not closing churches. Um, so I think that they're under tremendous pressure right now. Um, the ones I've talked to, you know, almost no matter what decision they make is a very difficult one. I think especially courageous were the early decisions to close churches because that was, those were very difficult decisions when others were not necessarily leading, leading the way. And that was probably really essential for the church to have solidarity with our surrounding world in how to, how to um, protect. So um, that, I guess that's the only comment I would make. Yeah, I just want to, I, I just probably add to this uh, that indeed it's not only criticism from laity, uh, it's also criticism from other churches and uh, uh, they just continue, you know, the, the controversy, the quarrel that they had before the, the, before the virus, the, before the COVID, uh, the inter-jurisdictional wars. They continue just with a new shape of, you know, with the new rhetoric of, uh, of uh, attitude to the virus. Just one example, for instance, you know, the ecumenical patriarchate was the, among the first, probably the first who closed down all the churches and it was a, re, a very bold step and well, no surprise, it was immediately criticized you know, by, by the Moscow patriarchate, by some, by some bishops and uh, the, the most striking example is probably the criticism that they just read on the Facebook of you know, the uh, Archbishop Yona from, uh, from Kiev, who himself is in reanimation now in intensive care. In, in Kiev, but uh, before that he was very critical about, you know, the ecumenical patriarchy and so forth. So it's not, it's not just a criticism, you know, from the laity towards bishops. It's also an inter-bishops, inter-jurisdictional kind of uh, discussion of quarrel or war, whatever you call it, and it's, it's bad. <laughs> and of course, it's also interconnected with um, the, the larger secular political conversation about how to respond to this situation and um, all of the uh, uh, debates over what should be classified as an essential service. And Father Andre um, alluded to this question. Um, you know, we have grocery stores open and I don't know, here in Canada, we have liquor stores open, um, but we, we don't have churches open. So, um, you know, who's, who's making these decisions and, and um, what is what is the right approach? Yes, I was speaking to Father Stephen Platt in Oxford recently, and he was saying that the Anglican Church, which uh, cancelled well, all not just public services but all kinds of services, that many people within the Anglican Church uh, felt that this movement, uh, what it really meant, is that Christ and prayer to Him are not. Uh, in any way central anymore to the life of the church and fair, felt very much disappointed. But of course, you know, this, this really depends on the role of the community in, in the society and in the state. If the voice of the community can be heard, like for example, the, the Anglican Church in the UK, or if it's like, for example, like the Orthodox Church in Spain, which is a minority, and unlike the Catholic Church, it does not really have a voice which would be heard by the authorities. And it really is, the, you know, when we speak about the decisions, it's not just that they're right or wrong, but the important thing is, you know, do, do we have our own agenda or do we just react to uh, what is being imposed in a correct or in an incorrect way by the, uh, by the state authorities? Sister Vasa, would you like to um, respond to that? Yes, I've, it, it has been fascinating how um, it, it's almost like a right-left issue, like the left tends to be more compliant. And it's a strange thing that just like climate change, it's like somehow a right-left issue. But besides that, <coughs> there has been this 
completely false uh, posing of the question for people who are suddenly, oh, this is our, you know, our freedom is being a pinch, uh, you know, imposed upon. Um, is this really an issue of uh, right? Just like when the smoking laws started, started to gain uh, force in the States, uh, you know, some people could have thought, well, look, you don't want to be in a smoking space, then leave. But why should the smokers not be allowed to smoke? Because you're endangering their health, right? With secondhand smoke was the answer. Um, Austria is like a third world country in that until like a few months ago, you could actually still smoke in like restaurants and pubs um, were you, uh, you know, to want to do so. Uh, but, you know, the logic of what, what, what do you have the right to, um, I think is very twisted in this, in this case. I mean, the fact is that if you don't know whether you're a carrier of the disease, right, and you're infecting other people, um, I think... I think this is an issue, just like, you know, in the East, uh, actually, the church was more likely to, you know, recognize the state's authority in issues even like marriage and divorce until fairly recently, you know, like that was, a, that was something that got the state decided rather than the church. Uh, I think that in this area, I, maybe Gail will be able to chime in on this, um, you know, I don't think the church is equipped to make decisions as to what the actual guidelines should be. Those, you know, the epidemiologists uh, who, you know, the government has resources to, uh, I realize sometimes some countries have a buffoon at the head of the state, but um, I'm, I'm not uh, naming any concrete country. <laughs> um, anyway, you know, like how, how are we going to, say that the church can make this decision as to what the guidelines should be. And I think that it would be a lot easier if the state stepped in in this area much more strongly. You know, like my elderly parents, if I could add like a, actually this is recorded, right? Anyway, some elderly people are continuously being reckless and driving insane people who have common sense. Like I'm presuming that at least in this issue, I'm not, I have it. And you know, I, they're not even complying with what their actual immediate church authority is saying they're allowed to do, you know? And, uh, you know, um, I hear today, you know, there's a Palm Sunday liturgy. It's a tiny church. There's five clergymen in the sanctuary, which is very small in the altar. There's three singers. There's, uh, you know, elderly people. Um, this is going on in New York. You know, and this, to me, that this is, you know, allowed and that it's supposedly our freedom uh, to do this, um, I wish that the state authorities would step in. Because the way that our people have twisted this sometimes, but you hear this in Russia, you know, in Russia also, they, I, I heard that tomorrow it's all going to, they're actually going to be forced to close down. I'm not sure it's true. But there were a hundred people going to Holy Communion at a liturgy yesterday in a church that I know, you know? And, but when I'm talking about a place that's like in the epicenter in New York, I'm hearing about bishops coming, having dinner with certain people that I know of uh, eight people dinner um, that actually came, I thought that I stopped it because I was making phone calls. No, they had it. Um, I just feel like, you know what? I, here is where I want the state to step in and just say, we're gonna force you not to be able to do that. You know, yeah. I mean, I'd like to comment. I want to say two things related to that. Number one is, um, I think to some extent the step, state has stepped in. I mean, it is said we are going to limit the size of gatherings. I mean, we have a, a a a funeral in our parish this week from a beloved member, and they are going to be eight people there, and they all must stand eight six feet apart, and um, they're not even allowed to go into the um, church. They're not allowed to go, they're only allowed in the funeral home at a very big distance. Those are following our state guidelines. So I think most governments have stepped in and in New York, they're not, they're just not following their guidelines because the guidelines are there. You can actually report that. I mean, if, if you wanted to, you can report them. Um, but what I will say secondly is that there's a big issue we need to think about after this is over. 
And that is the reception of communion. And that is something our church does have control over. So my worry, I mean, we are not dualists. We believe that the body and blood of Christ is still the bread and wine when we receive it and is subject to all the corruption and everything else that happens to bread and wine. So is it possible to, to, to transmit COVID via bread and wine? It is a very hardy virus. You bet it's going to be possible to transmit it. What are we going to do? Are we going to change? Are we going to think about how we give communion? I mean, I, I know somebody sent me an article that said during um, the plague, we, they used to use uh, tongs and they'd pick up the bread that had been dipped in wine and put it in the mouth of the uh, communicant. Well, I think this is something we better be talking about now because we're going to be out of quarantine soon and it's going to be a real problem. That's something we do have control over and it will be very controversial. Deacon Nicholas, uh, you wanted to jump in. Yes, and, and as much as I want to uh, shift to Gail's more recent comment about communion, I, I just wanted to say that I think that um, right now it's a simplistic question and it seems almost trite to raise it. And that is the question of, well, what is the church? And a lot of the ways that we've been talking about what is the church, we have to be very careful about reductionistic. A church is essential services to gather for worship. This is a core value of who we are and not only Orthodox Christians, but many other Christians and many other religions in the world. But really the church is a community. And I think that this, um, as unfortunate as it is and unanticipated and difficult, burdensome, it is an opportunity for us to ask ourselves, how do we relate to the community around us? How do we interact with the community around us? Do we continue to go about our business and uh, simply defend our little parcel here in a spirit of mutual exclusivity while so-and-so gets to do what they want so we get to do what we want because this is one of our core values and it's constitutionally or uh, otherwise legally guaranteed? Or do we have a responsibility to a community not only by civil law, but also in terms of uh, what uh, the Christian community actually is. And that leads me to just kind of two little reflective points. One, I, with appreciation for Father Alex's uh, earlier comment, you know, a lot of the discussion about the Eucharist has been focusing, going to Gail's comment, at least in, in part, on uh, here's communion, this is so core to us that we can't step away from it for a short period of time. And uh, the theologian Henri de Lubac uh, spoke about uh, the medieval theological synthesis being one of the church making the Eucharist. And it sounds sometimes like we're returning to that synthesis. That the only reason that we gather is to see this miracle of uh, coming together to see uh, the Holy Spirit descend and the words of Christ invoked so that bread and, and cup become Jesus's true body and blood, uh, where de Lubac and many other theologians in dialogue with him talk about the whole point of the Eucharist is for us to become the church, for us to become a community which uh, really interacts with, uh, cares for, uh, learns how to see the world and um, understand our position in the world. And I think that um, this whole conversation is kind of challenging us to say, what really is our core value? Is our core value to say that, hey, 2020 happened and we still did our services and we fulfilled the obligation and we, and we observed the ordo, or is 2020 a challenge for us to be a people, to become a people that says, uh, we trust God enough uh, to be able to set aside even what seems to be our, our most core value right now to do, uh, so we're not, some of us perhaps, but many of us aren't being asked to put on masks and go into the hospitals and to clinics and to test people and to uh, perhaps care for sick people, but simply to just stay put for a while. And perhaps, um, you know, I think if we think of it in these terms, this is an opportunity for us to rethink what are our core values as a church? 
Thank you. We're, we're going to go to Father Cyril Hovaroon in a moment, um, but just before we do, I wanted to um, interject another question um, to sort of pick up on the point that Deacon Nicholas just made, um, and that is the issue of online services. Uh, of course, some parishes are, are offering a full schedule of online services and trying to maintain a sense of uh, the parish community virtually, and even a uh, semblance of, of liturgical life. Um, so one of our, our readers actually writes in to ask um, how this adoption of live streaming and video conferencing is altering practices of Orthodox worship, and whether we should see that as a, a useful remedy and a good way to maintain community in this situation, um, or potentially <laughs> as, as um, presenting a danger of, of distorting our, our understanding of the liturgy and, and presenting a kind of false sense of participation. And we heard from um, another reader um, who, uh, on the same topic, um, pointed out that uh, a lot of the particular creativity um, that seems to have been manifest in this world of, of virtual church life um, has especially come from the laity. Um, so maybe perhaps picking up on something that Sister Vasa pointed out about the origins of um, uh, the monastic movement in the church. Um, and so as this reader is wondering whether uh, that could have an impact in on um, church life post-coronavirus. Yeah, I think I will withdraw my, my intervention because um, I wanted to uh, follow some previous comments, and I think it's an opportunity indeed to answer these questions, which are which are of importance. Maybe someone else will will want to answer them. Um, yes, uh, sister. I think, uh, I think that the, you know I mentioned in one of my podcasts recently that there is an expression in the Slavonic typical. <coughs> um, uh, um, sort of a typical freak, but to to create. Uh, services like Tvarim Bzenia or Tvarim Bogosluzhenia that, uh, you know, uh, people would be probably loath to consider, you know, creativity in liturgy in a tradition that's as, has been as stuck as ours, uh, you know, since, may, you know, at the, uh, I would say, at the latest since the mid 17th century with no interesting changes, whereas it was very much robustly changing, um, you know, pre-iconoclasm <laughs> after iconoclasm. Um, but, you know, to change anything now seems to be very suspect. And when I say I think we need to rediscover the daily office, I think, you know, I'm, I'm very, uh, I mean that very broadly, uh, taking certain elements, just the core of it, you know, like literally, we do have these hours, one, you know, can do it differently, but to do something that we do, I mean, liturgia has to be doing, it's, it's, it's not liturgical saying, it's not liturgical thinking, it's liturgical doing, it's, well, that's tautological, but it's, you know, we have to be doing, that's why I think that a, it's it's really hard to follow through the screen a service. You know, it's it's really quite um, uh, you know it's not the same, and it just drags on, and you know a lot of other things begin to distract you. If you do do something like have those, you know, you go through all of salvation history, um, you know, through the daily office, uh, and finding some way, it doesn't matter, like, you know, the, the Dida Hay will have you just do three Our Fathers, you know, spread out through the day, morning, middle of the day, and in the evening. And, uh, or as Deacon Nicholas said so helpfully, why don't we get closer to scripture, you know? Um, and I think that, you know, Theophan the Recluse said, it doesn't matter what you're putting into the fire, the fuel, it's that you keep the fire going. So, you know, but we have so infantilized the laity that they're waiting for you to say, oh, tell me I don't need to fast. Look, if, you're, if you can't fast now, then don't fast. The, you know, the canonical rule about fasting says that those who are um, too weak to do it, uh, 
are exempt from it. You, it's built in. You don't, you, you don't have to be told, we don't have fasting police that's going to come and say, why aren't you fasting? But no, we're waiting for father to tell us, you know, exactly how to fast. You're an adult. You know, there's, I think things like that, you know, adults, normal adults should be able to decide for themselves. But also with this new responsibility to structure their prayer day, right? Um, which is very helpful for time management in general, also for your work. So not to, uh, to maybe, you know, as we work with people right now online, to give ideas, to give people encouragement, and to give them the dignity of making their decisions, you know? Because this kind of, uh, you know, that, that whole distortion of obedience, you know, that's one of these big problems, in the church and misinterpreting what obedience means, whether you're saying it in Greek, you know, um, as ipakoi, or you're saying it from, uh, you know, in English, it means exactly the same thing, right? From ob and audire uh, to sort of lean in and listen. Um, lay people, uh, or also I'll translate, you know, the Greek term as leaning in and listening. Um, people have different uh, things to listen into as God sends them. And lay people, if you have, you know, little, little children jumping on your bed at six in the morning when you still want to sleep, well, you're not going to be able to because you're, you know, you're very limited uh, through that, through other responsibilities, if you're a family person, um, to learn, you know, to embrace the kind of life and not to have this you know, we have a lot of distortions in orthodoxy of what it means to uh, be obedient. Uh, people running to the magic elder, you know, in the monastery to, to uh, ask what their prayer rule should be and this kind of nonsense. They, if people can step up and be, you know, recognize, look, you guys, it's also not fair to the priests. Priests also need to be protected right now. Um, some of my friends, you know, in Moscow that have been really just thrown uh, really, you know, to the wolves with this virus thing because they can't really stop celebrating, uh, you know, when they're, they have to be paying their, pe to the diocese still, the dues, if they don't have the income and they have families, uh, they don't know what to do. They're placed, so, you know, I'm saying priests need to be protected, but the responsibility of the laity also for the sake, it's not a black and white, you know, of evil clerics trying to seize power and control over us. Some of them are just, you know, because the laity behave like infants sometimes, not everywhere, you know, but uh, some of them do. Um, and anyway, sorry, you get what I mean. No, that's great. Um, Father, uh, Father Alexis Vinogradov, would, would you like to respond to that and, and pick up on this issue of the, the clergy, the laity, all the issue also of online services? You know, it all, I think, uh, comes back to uh, Deacon Nicholas's uh, very valid point that, uh, uh, or I guess what, what Timothy Ware, uh, Archbishop Kalistos, was urging us to do a long time to ask the two questions having to do with uh, what is the church really? I mean, it's this is the time we are inside uh, something that will um, that will probably uh, uh, um, be do an examination after the fact. We are inside it, experiencing it, but we don't quite uh, can't grasp uh, its meaning. So we'll have to examine that. But I think that examination must come really uh, uh, within the light of living tradition, as, as Sister Vasa has has urged us to, that the, the, the liturgical life, uh, the, the 250 anaphoras that Gregory Dix speaks about in the early church, you know, just to be aware of this diversity of our expression, the dura ropus, the early, the house church, right? All of these things, what is the church? And then what are we as, as, uh, as, a, as a person that has been become a new creation in Christ, an eschatological being belonging to heaven, to paradise? What does that mean and its implications precisely on all these structural questions that we are talking about? Um, I would imagine that having come from out inside where we are now and being able to look back with creative hindsight, I think there's some phenomenal, phenomenal 
answers will appear from that if we remain open enough and indeed, as Sister Vasa, to involve informed laity and not just make this a clerical enterprise, but really open the thinking of the church uh, post, uh, I don't want to say post mortem, uh, there is part of that, of course, but post factum, perhaps, uh, when this is all uh, has settled into uh, some form of normalcy where we can come together, that we don't just write it off, but then uh, I think all the Hopefully, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit will come upon us to truly imagine imagine uh, how we move forward uh, with with openness, with love, with charity, of course, too. Because I think, in some sense, and I'll end this, but my awareness now that our our attempt to to hang on to um, little bits and pieces of ordo, of performance, of doing, of connecting, you know, this is all the impulse within all of us, I believe to touch the hem of Christ's robe, to feel the power from the material that we uh, sacralize uh, in the world as maybe something to, to touch that might connect me beyond my kind of intellect, but just the need for uh, the transmission of hope through physical things, whatever they may be. Uh, I think there's in part a search for that. And maybe that what answers the question of needing the, the blessed branch today from the willow tree, uh, uh, needing uh, some, what the symbol is of the bread and wine, to touch it, to taste it, to have it. Uh, after all, and we're reminded in the consecration, are we not, that uh, we call upon the Holy Spirit on the Epiclesis to come upon us and the gifts here offered. The transformation I want to walk out of church life is being changed by the Holy Spirit a different person than the one I walked in. Hopefully that's... So after this experience, my hope is that I'm a different person than having walked in to greet little corona buggers traveling around. <laughs> uh, Father Andrei Korochkin, you would like to respond. Yes, well, I just wanted to comment on what Sister Vasa said. Um, I think that for many communities, uh, the challenge is that we're facing is really not just a theological challenge, but in a sense, an economical one. And uh, I would like to, to explain that. A couple of months ago, I was invited to a, a Protestant church that we have nearby, which had its inauguration. And when I entered, you know, the first thing I realized is that, you know, when one comes to an Orthodox church in Russia or in Greece, the first thing that we see is a shop. Now, <laughs> Uh, which basically keeps the church running. Now, when you come to a Protestant community, you say that there is no shop and they have other means of forming, uh, you know, the budget of the, of the parish. So in some sense, I think that the Orthodox churches uh, in Russia and also in, in Western Europe, they will be faced with a challenge which the Protestant churches or the Catholic churches uh, do not have because in so many cases, we are not, uh, we're dependent on the physical presence of the people to, uh, to maintain the church. So, for example, you know, some weeks ago we spoke to Father Andrei Psarev from Jordan Mill, who has a, his blog on, on, on YouTube, and he asked me, you know, what, what, how do I understand the subordinates of the church and how can we, I, we can define a church community uh, fulfilling this uh, idea of subordinates. And I said that to me, it would be a church which does not have a shop and which does not really have a necessity to sell something <laughs> to, uh, to maintain itself. So I think that uh, maybe it would not be a fashionable thing to speak about these days, but I think that in many ways, this material aspect of uh, maintain, maintaining a parish life will have to be Reconsidered. I don't know about the United States, but I think that in Russia or in other countries, it will definitely uh, be be the case. I don't know if I make myself clear, but this idea. Thank yes, thank you, Father. Um, we're, we are almost out of time, um, but I wanted to um, to bring in Father Peter Scorer one more time. Uh, Father Peter, would you like to um, to respond to this issue? I find it difficult to respond. There have been so many excellent presentations and I am much encouraged by what people have been saying, but it is absolutely clear to me that 
our concept of worship, our concept of liturgy, is going to have to be changed radically in the light of what we are now experiencing. And I think possibly the Orthodox Church, as uh, Sister Vasa has said, you know, uh, hasn't changed anything in 500 or 600 years. We're still celebrating the same way and using the same words that people used in the 17th century. And something needs to change and something needs to, uh, we need the inspiration of, we need leaders, leaders are very important, but we also have to talk about the priesthood of all believers. And we have to teach our people about the priesthood of all believers and the responsibility that every single person has to take. And if we lose some people on the way because they are more attached to what Father Alexander Schmemann would say, religion rather than Christ, well, so be it, we might, we might lose them. But maybe we'll have a greater sense of community and a greater sense of the world as sacrament, again, using Father Alexander's term. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers. This has been a truly illuminating conversation and we're, we're so grateful to uh, Deacon Nicholas Denisenko, Father Cyril Hovarun, Father Andre Korochkin, Sister Vasa Laren, Father Peter Skorer, Father Alexis Vinogradov, and Dr. Gail Walshak. Uh, and a big thanks to everybody watching. These are all issues that we are gonna continue exploring and reflecting on um, as, as a church, and we're certainly going to continue reflecting on in the wheel. So I would invite anybody who isn't a subscriber to our journal to check us out at wheeljournal.com. <laughs> uh, looking ahead, we wish everyone a joyous celebration of the resurrection. Good day. Thank you. May I have one Thank question? Thank you. Dan. I think we should ask Gail, what is ahead of us? Gail, tell us. Uh, I don't know. I think the Lord knows. I don't know. I mean, they, as far as you know, it's very hard to predict. It's very hard to predict. <laughs>